All right, here we are at another episode of Creative Mind. In this episode, we've got spiders, we've got dungeons, and of course, they're dragons. We've got beach bodies, and we've got Jonathan Dice. This is another episode in our continuing series on what it's like to be a working professional, somebody whose art career is going to span once they graduate from college all the way until 20, 30, 40 years from now. Now, Jonathan and I actually go way back, way back when he was my instructor for about a year. So we sat down and talked about what had gone on in his career. He started off as an architect. He worked his way up into becoming a creative director, working with multinational brands, working on movie trailers, and then he decided that he wanted to start his own companies. He retired from being a creative director and took that knowledge of how to run art and design and business together, and he started looking for businesses that he could become an investor in and start to run. And so this is a great conversation for anybody that is feeling a bit stale in their career or not really sure what a career in art and design looks like. So sit back, take some notes, and here we are with Jonathan Dice. You know, you're going to have to really help me with this, Jonathan, because I'm not a D&D player because I'm of that generation that I was told that if I started playing D&D, Satan would manifest in my bedroom and take me straight to hell. So as we all were. <laughs> so what happened with Dungeons and Dragons becoming something that was creatively and monetarily successful to get you thinking about this as a business? There was, I, I grew up in the same generation, the generation of, you know, my mom was afraid of the books and she was afraid when we were playing because she didn't really understand what the game was about. And, you know, it's not, it's not really structured in the way that a traditional game is commonly structured because it's all about imagination and sort of playing. It's as if, it's, it's as if you took something like playing war with your friends and you added statistics and random dice rolls to it to determine like if you actually shot them or if they shot you or those kinds of things. That, that's all it is. It's a structured system around adventuring, which is really more of a narrative, like a spoken narrative. So it, it, it wasn't cool for a long time, I think, because yeah, back then it was a certain archetype of persona that was playing it. It was the, the nerds or the geeks or whatever. And, and there was a lot sort of harder separation between, you know, your different high school groups right it was very very clicky yeah very clicky yeah it was an extremely clicky kind of a thing and so you had a very narrow range of people that were that were sort of into it but then you did also have your jocks that were into it but you know they just sort of kept it hidden well no, it's funny when, when i was you know like all of us we've watched stranger things and you know that first episode and the first scene of stranger things it looks like the greatest pizza party, fun time, happy hour, Dungeons and Dragons moment. And then we all look back to when a lot of us first saw Dungeons and Dragons on, on a movie. It was, and it was all smoky and there's money. And I think somebody is smoking a cigarette. And I remember my mom going, you're not going to do that. You're not going to play with those kids. I'm like, I don't even know what the heck's going on, lady. In Dungeons and Dragons, you play a character that advances over time. So they get stronger, they get better, they get gain more skills, they get better weapons and all that stuff. So you end up, becoming kind of attached to this imaginary character because it's, it's sort of an avatar for you. You know, it's another right. version of yourself that you can sort of play a game with. But anyway, but flash forward to today and some of the stigmatism has been taken away from it because people no longer think that it's witches incantations and spells and magical stuff. And in, re and in reality, a lot of this gameplay is the exact same gameplay as Pokemon, which is, you know, Jigglypuffs and Hoobly Bloops and it's yeah, points it and numbers and stuff. I mean, it's, it's a basic, it all gets down to math, the ultimate, you know, non threatening yeah, yeah, thing on life. It, all, all Gary Gygax did was he took, he, he knew that people wanted to sit around and play in their fantasy worlds. He knew that people wanted to be in the movie Legend and be Tom Cruise and be a fighter and go and fight, you know, the devils. He knew people wanted to do that, but there was no way to do it before Gygax came along. All he did was systematize imagination. That was his big insight. I'm going to use random die rolls and various sets of rules to systematize the ability for people to live inside of a narrative world and use their imagination and to sort of walk around this world. And the dungeon master is essentially the person who originates the story. They're the one who tells everybody what's happening and what the results are. That's really all it is. It's just a reason to get together with your friends to hang out and goof off, you know? Right, exactly. And, you know, and you, you compare it to something like video games where people f still freak out. It's like, well, no, you're actually, it's human interaction and it's... Yeah 
perfectly fine. There's nothing, For sure. nothing For sure. wrong with it. So, so, to answer your question, so to answer your question, which I have, haven't yet, is why, why did it become a part? Why is it now more open? Is because people just generally become less suspicious of it. Um, the people who were younger and who were children at the time, they're now older, they're more affluent adults. So they know, they know better. There's no moms in around telling them anymore they can't have the books. So you're really in a situation now where it's just the, the, those guys who thought to themselves when they were younger, like I did, well, when I finally get out of the house, I'll be able to do this. Well, they're doing it now. And, you know, for, for me, it's just a reason to get together with some of my closest friends frequently and, you know, have something to do. And, but in mainstream society now, it's become much more accepted. There, we, don't, we no longer view this division between the jocks and the geeks as being the most important possible thing in the world. It, right, we, absolutely. We Yes, society's changed a little bit in terms of the way we perceive these kinds of activities. So as a result of that, there's been a real growth in people being interested in and wanting to play the game. And you also have some you know, Hollywood celebrities out there talking about the, how they played uh, D&D and how it got them started. Which right, and, and, that, and that's, a, that's an interesting way of looking at it because, I mean, that's something that you kind of latched into because we have with baseball cards and sports memorabilia, there is this whole concept of collectability and then you've got dungeons and dragons which now has like you said older people people who have jobs people who have got the ability to spend the money they always wanted to on their D, &D games part of the games have figures and different dice and yes. better tables and music and you're creating oh, yeah. a whole world where you actually have the money to do it. And that money means products have to be made to be yeah. sold. The and evil marketing funny. aspect of it. Yeah. And it's fun. And people, you know, you can play, there are people that I know who play Dungeons and Dragons in a version that they call theater of the mind, which is a really essentially that you're just sitting at a table talking about what's happening. There's no, it's almost like you're telling a story and you're just giving people the ability to sort of choose what they want to do inside the story so that the dungeon master can keep wielding it. It's kind of like those choose your own adventure books that were extremely popular back in right. the day. Right, you know, right. It's just like you turn to a page and it says, do you want to kick this guy in the face or do you want to run away? And then you pick and then you turn to another page and you read what the next thing is. Right. There are, you know, your, your really into it types who will build entire tables of landscapes with hills and mountains and buildings. And, you know, you, you can play D&D &D where you use, you know, whatever. You can use a, you can use a, a, a chapstick bottle to represent your character where your character's standing in a fight. You don't have to have a, a thing that looks like a fighter. And that's what we did when we were kids. But the thing is nowadays, some of those, as those kids are older and they're more affluent, as we know, the geeks end up winning in the end because the geeks, are, <laughs> the geeks have the money. The jobs right. end up, exactly. the jobs end up live, reliving their, you know, reliving their uh, high Glory school days. Day. Yeah. Never, never leaving the town they grew up in, and the geeks go out and they get the positions at the companies that allow them to have the disposable income to actually do this. And then that, 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 that translates into real wealth in the industry. So those, a lot of these guys who are really into it, you know, they, they go all out. I, I'm kind of in a middle sort of zone. I try to have a little bit of, of like trees or little buildings if I have them. And I certainly like having the miniatures because obviously that's the business that I'm in. But, you know, I don't go out and say, buy a candle. There are candles you can buy that when you light them, they smell like dank dungeons. You make a whole house smell like a dank dungeon. Uh, <laughs> okay, that, 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 now that, that's a little weird. Yeah, that, that's yeah. A I, weird. I do sometimes whip out the, my portable speaker and I put on D&D um, &D music, which is really just okay. the Rings music, you know? Right, sure. <laughs> and, and, and all the music is titled by what's happening, like boss <laughs> battle. Or it, it, it honestly, any, everybody's played video games. It's like right. video games, right? Yeah. There's boss battles. There's in between boss battles. There's how how you're explained what you're supposed to do. It's the same kind of a structure as most video games. So you know, it, anyway, I, I I tend to be somewhere in the middle with that. But that has opened up a variety of different new types of businesses: terrain developers, uh, miniature developers, and designers. People who make dice or specifically make really really high end custom dice that might cost you a hundred bucks. And, you know, guys pay for this kind of stuff because they want to have that game that they weren't either affluent enough or it just simply wasn't possible to have when they were mm. a kid. And so that brought you into starting Thrill Studio, which is strictly miniatures for D&D &D, or is that where it's starting out? Well, the funny thing is I, I started, what happened was a friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine actually wanted to get our group back together that we hadn't played in a long time, probably about a decade. 
And uh, when I, I wanted to have the kind of game that I was just describing where I have all the items that I wanted. And so I was going to get a guy in my neighborhood to paint my miniatures for me. And he, 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 he's busy all the time. He doesn't have a lot of time to do that stuff. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to have really nice miniatures for my game, then I might as well get the miniatures and paint them myself. And I figured out that there were a lot of really good miniatures that weren't available through the companies that actually make miniatures specifically for D&D. That sort of transformed into, I'm just going to sell a little bit of what I make so that I can pay for the stuff I want to get. Right. Because you know, it can get really expensive. You know, if, you've, if you want to have, you know, every kind of monster that a character can potentially face. I mean, there are hundreds of monsters in the monster manual, you know, for Dungeons and Dragons. So anyway. Well, and that's how a lot I, of people who are into collectibles kind of get started in the business of collectibles. It's, you know, I, I'm going to buy these baseball cards and I don't, these ones are worth a lot of money, but I don't really like yeah. that guy, but it, somebody will give me 10 bucks for it. I can sell that. And I got 10 bucks to go spend on something yeah, else sure. that I really like. For sure. And I, and I don't want to make it over, seem overly specific that everybody who's buying stuff from me is buying because of Dungeons and Dragons. Honestly, some of the people who buy from me are just people who they like to paint miniatures. The, the miniature painting itself is the hobby. And, and I'm sure there are people also who just like the miniatures in their raw form and just collect them for that purpose. You know, I, I talk about D&D mostly because that's sort of how I got into it. And that's, I think, the majority of my, my purchasers are people who are buying specifically for that. So that, that, anyway, that process of wanting to start my group back up again opened the door for me to consider Thrill as a business. As either initially it started as a business where we were painting for people and we would do commissions. And then that transformed into a business where we would pre-paint items and we would sell them painted. What yeah. brought the idea for you to start a studio creating and, or painting and then creating miniatures for well, like I said it was just that this it was this kid I met in my neighborhood that I wanted to paint for me you know he was doing commissions and he was he, he's a little bit of like an urban um scavenger you know he just does whatever he can do to sort of make money he's actually the partner my partner in the uh, spiders business ironically yeah we're gonna we're gonna come back we're gonna definitely yeah. spend some time on that one of course, of course. <laughs> so you know he he what would happen is I'd go over to his house and try to pick up stuff that he was supposed to paint for me. And he, he was, had too many commissions, so he never had time. So all I'd do is I'd just sit there and we'd hang out and we'd look at, I'd look at the stuff that he had painted and his, he's a really a top painter. He's a world-class painter. So that got me thinking like, oh man, I want to do this. I want to paint these miniatures. Cause I, I wanted a hobby of some kind that I could mm -hmm. do it with, you know? So that led, what, what happened was we started doing it. And then I actually quickly realized that financially that wasn't the best system because even if you pre-paint miniatures, which allows you to batch process them in more of an assembly line fashion, you you still can't really charge enough to get your labor costs out of it unless you do very, very large batches, which then requires you to not do it by hand. So what, in, what, what that ended up transforming into was, why don't I just try and sell unpainted and painted that'll open up the marketplace to people who want who are painters on their own. And that really transformed the business because the reality was is that a lot of people came in and they saw the painted items, but they wanted to paint them themselves. That makes sense. I mean, it is, it is a personal hobby at that point. Working, it was a work in progress, to be honest. At the time I was working at a job. So, you know, developing thrill was a side thing for me. It was a nights and weekend kind of a thing. And I was fumbling around a little bit at first, you know, let's try painting. Let's try buying big boxes full of miniatures and let's paint all 10 of them or 20 of them all at the same time. Let's paint them all the same and let's try and sell them. And then let's see what happens. Let's analyze that financially and see what the result was. Well, it turned out the result wasn't that great. <laughs> so, you know, so then it was, okay, well, we've got all these miniatures. What if we just, what if I just try to sell the miniatures independently? And what if I also sell the game components? Because one of the things that my friend had put me onto was that really some of the best miniatures are actually in board games where role-playing gamers don't see them. And it's weird because role-playing gamers and board game players, you'd think that there would be a huge overlap in that Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I found that people who are interested in, in role-playing games and people who are interested in D&D and, and, and board games, it's not really the same people. So, you know, I have a lot of people who wonder where I'm getting these products from. And, you know, it turns out that they're just coming from places where they haven't seen them. And that was the big insight. I can go out on on the web and I can get find new miniatures that role-playing gamers, for, especially for Dungeons and Dragons, don't know exist, haven't seen before. And I can then part them out and sell them individually. And so that became really the real thrill. 
but that was, you know, hell, I was probably eight to nine months into it before I really hit that stride of what the current business model is today. And that's something that's, that, that is fascinating for, for me because from a collectible standpoint, um, you've got people who are really rabid fans of something very specific. So not even yeah. niche where it's, I'm into this game and I'm into this character in this style, in this pose, and that is what I want. And I want everything yeah. of that version. And then you talked about you're parting something out. And for what a lot of people don't understand is if you're buying a game, some people only want that one little piece. They don't want to buy the yes. whole game. They want the piece. Yep. And, I and, and this goes into a lot of collectibles. I mean, even Lego guys will put up on eBay individual parts from Lego kits because somebody really only wants that part. They don't want the whole kit. That secondary market is kind of a fascinating business and that you've been able to build a business on that is is pretty unique to what you're doing would you say that you are curating pieces or are you commissioning pieces yeah. well the primary business now is the curation of other people's creative work i'm not we're not doing any miniature designs ourselves okay um it, and and par partly that's getting miniatures from other companies that are selling them for especially say in board games but now we've also moved into some 3d printing I have a partner up in Canada who, um, he was somebody who I met online. I was just looking for partners to potentially do 3D printing. And I came across his website. He was, he was one of a number of people that I spoke to that I kind of was interested in maybe seeing if I could build a relationship with him. And he sent me some of his, his stuff that he was making and his 3D printing was amazing. And he was doing resin printed, printing. Oh, wow. I was so impressed that I felt like, yeah, this is the guy I definitely want to partner with. So we... We bought about $8,000 worth of machines, which only accounts for two machines. Oh my gosh. To add into the ones that he already had. And now we're doing a lot of um, on-demand printing of collections that are happening that other people design, which has become a new industry. Uh, huh. there, there are people out there who go to schools, let's say for 3D modeling, and they think, oh, I'm going to work in the movie industry, or maybe I'll work in architecture, or maybe I'll work in, you know. Industrial design like or something that. like that. Well, a new thing that they can do now is they can develop lines of miniatures for, you know, that they design themselves and then basically create either Patreon subscription pages mm -hmm. or, or they can sell, they can simply sell the digital files that are actually used to print, which are called STL files for 3D printing. So it's, it started a whole new industry of designers now who are opening up what's possible. Previously, one of the things that really limited companies that made miniatures specifically for Dungeons and Dragons is if you open up, say the original monster manual, like I mentioned before, there are about a hundred monsters in there. And there might be a monster in there that is extremely rare that a person's not going to run into, you know, because there's only one in the whole fake world, right? Okay, or there's right, only a, right. a dozen or something like that because, you know, some monsters are rare. Well, a company can't go out and, and, that's doing this in mass production and make 10,000 units of that miniature because it's not going to be financially viable. Yeah, there's not 10,000 customers for this. Yeah, exactly. There's not that many people that are willing to buy the miniature. So the problem that you run into is the, the economics of the, of the system prevent large batches of rare and unique and obscure items. With 3D printing, you can have anything you want. All you need is a design. That's right. all you need. It's all, it's all print on demand. Correct. So what some of these people are doing is they go back through and they pop out the current monster manual for Dungeons and Dragons, which is, I've said that like 10 times. So I probably should define it. It's like a dictionary of monsters. Right. It tells you all their stats and what they do and where you find them and how dangerous they are and how much gold they have and how much experience points they're worth, et cetera. So there are people out there that are going out and they're designing every single miniature from the, from the original monster manuals. And you know you can buy these STL files for four or five bucks. If you're on a Patreon page, you pay 50 bucks a month and they just release packages every month. And you can print anything you want that you can get a design for. And this has really expanded the industry and it's meant that the, the really obscure stuff that you otherwise couldn't get your hands on is now available to you. It's just a matter of finding a maker who produces it. So what I'm doing right now is moving into this space by trying to ex get as many makers, designers as possible and get their products up as quickly as possible for this uh, Christmas season. Because I think this is really going to be legitimately the first year of that as a real business. 
as a 3D, as 3D printed objects become products that are just as common as something that you buy that's pre-made by a company. I think this is the turn, the turning point in history when that's going to be the case because 3D printing's gotten cheap enough and the quality's gotten high enough at that price point that it's now become viable to run a business entirely by 3D printing items. And it doesn't require a factory size machine. It just requires something that you can fit in your own home. Well, and that, that really is a fascinating thing. And I, 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 I agree with you that there is something that is changing in all of this collectible based industry. Yeah. I mean, at one point, I mean, I've talked to a lot of artists that, you know, 20 years ago were making, especially illustrators, were making a living doing these sports portraits and doing these um, paintings and illustrations and posters that would be sold to a company, possibly autographed and then sold yeah. for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, figurines, uh, way back when, you know, I'm going to use sports as a comparison because again, I didn't, I wasn't into Dungeons and Dragons, but I was a nerd. <laughs> I was a nerd into baseball cards. So, you know, some people will remember this. You had starting lineups, which were oh, yeah. little plastic guys. And you look at all this stuff and you go, I had to go to a store and buy this. I had to go out and search it. They didn't have the one I wanted. So I had to go to another store and it became a thing and it built this idea of scarceability. But now if I want it, I have the technology. We have the technology. We can build it. Yeah. Um, and the actual artists and designers are creating and making this stuff available. It's kind of is like, yeah, it is totally fascinating how it's a, a whole paradigm shift in the world of technology and artistry and craftsmanship. Yeah. Well, it's not, the shift is essentially that you, your customers can be anywhere. You know, I've sold product to over, I think, 35 or 40 countries now all over the world. So, you know, you couldn't, like, to, your, to your point, you couldn't, when you were a kid, if a store that you went to didn't have it, they just didn't have it. That's it. You can yeah. just jump on the internet. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you are, but, you know, I, the internet didn't, wasn't even a thing until I was in college. Right. So, you know, you couldn't just jump online and just go buy anything you want at any time, it, you know, for the price that you wanted it for. So what that does is it essentially commoditizes everything that's available on the internet because locality is no longer, locality no longer plays into the price scarcity of a thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's not about whether or not the store near you has it. It's whether or not any store on earth has it. Right. <laughs> so it really transforms the scale of things quite a bit. And, you know, with 3D printing, um, because a lot of these producers are out there online, there's lots of people who are, who decided, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go out and buy a couple 3d printers and I'm going to make these, I'm going to make this stuff and sell it online. It has become a new kind of an industry. My hope is that, that I'm in as a first mover that, that, mm -hmm. that, that once this starts to get rolling, what will happen is other people who don't have the same background I have professionally and don't know how to sustain a business through marketing and advertising efforts, et cetera, will gradually fall by the wayside as people who are operating at scale start to lower their prices to the point where people doing it for their, for a hobby in their backyard just can't afford it anymore. It's not worth it for them anymore. Right. And, so, and that, and you brought up something important that I, I want to get into, or you, you, yeah. you, you did my job for me and gave me a very nice segue. <laughs> uh, you didn't just uh, wake up one day and decide, well, I know how to do this because I know how to do this and I'm going to start a business and do creative. You, you had a bit of a different background before you got into running yeah. your own business. And it was, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, you and I met many, many years ago when I'm going to, no one can see it, but I'm going to use heavy air quotes when you were one of my teachers. You didn't teach <laughs> oh. me anything. And I'm just going to say that, you know, for posterity. <laughs> oh, I learned a few things, I, you know, back, back in the day, I guess. You yeah. know, something I learned how to do a, a database driven website for about a day. And then that was, then I tuned out. <laughs> everything, everything we were teaching at that school were things that could have popped. <laughs> I think everything we were learning back in the early web one was stuff that could have popped and yeah. ultimately didn't. Yeah. The, pro um, the, problem, the problem was everything back then was undifferentiated into a single person. Whereas right. now you have a front end developer, a back end developer, a middleware developer, a services pro guy, a designer, a creative yeah. director, you know, you have all different things. So, so the industry is that industry that w what I taught you about is matured to the point where really a lot of stuff that I taught is just, it doesn't it doesn't exist it was vaporware exist. yeah it was vaporware because right. it didn't right. become the paradigm of the of the industry well worse for people like me i was in a fine art program going why am i taking this class because you have <laughs> to take a technology class or you're not going to yeah. get a job bobby i'm like but i don't want to do that well it doesn't matter you're going to take this class well so, edu education you know we you you were at a, a somewhat of a technical school in a sense because you were right. in a visual communications department and it was about visual communications but you know 
education isn't just about what you're learning. It's also about learning to learn. You know, it, the, the reason we make kids who want to be, you know, anthropologists in high school still study English and history and math and science is because you have to learn the discipline of learning in order to succeed in life. And if, and, and one of the ways that I've succeeded is by having a hunger for figuring things out. And the only way you get hungry about figuring things out is if you train yourself over the course of your life from childhood to have an interest in discovery, to have curiosity, to be interested in new things, new ideas, new information. So, you know, schools sometimes hyper-focus on whatever they're training for in, in a vocational way. And that is important. But the truth is, whether or not you're going to be a great professional in whatever industry you choose is going to be more based on your work ethic, your, your intelligence, your ability to problem solve, and your attitude, like what people think of you, whether or not they like working with you. Th those things are going to drive your, your, your future success far more than any grade you ever got at any point in your life. Honestly. Absolutely. 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 And, and your career, though, was a little, well, not a little, but your, your career was definitely more on the visual and creative side, correct? I mean, you started well, off as an architect or no? Yeah, yeah. I started my... So, you know, I, I was really into architecture when I was a kid, especially residential home architectural design. And uh, I graduated at the top of class and I, I thought I really wanted to be an architect. And I worked as an architect for about a year, uh, a little bit over a year, year and a half. And then I uh, applied to grad schools and uh, fe still feeling like I wanted to be an architect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into good schools. I got into Harvard. I got into Columbia. I got into um, Berkeley, UCLA, Rice, I think. MIT. And, um, I had friends, oh, fancy guy. Yeah. I, should, I, I probably should have listened to you a little bit more when I was in, when I, I know. Right. I know. Right. I, ca yeah, I kept all probably. my acceptance letters just in case anybody <laughs> ever challenged me. I got like a four. <laughs> Why did you decide to put the, uh, the blueprints away? When I was in school, uh, a friend of mine had transferred over into the animation school. He really wanted to get into uh, animation. And so he did, he went over to get his master's in animation, but because he knew so many of us at the school, he'd come by all the time and hang out with us. And um, that was the first thing that opened up my mind to the fact that I could take classes in the design department over there. That, that was the impetus for everything. The reason I think that a lot of people who were in architecture didn't necessarily go into it is because there were more lucrative opportunities in related areas where they had technical skills. So. When I, by, by the time I was in grad school, we were doing everything in CAD and in 3D modeling programs like FormZ, which really doesn't exist anymore, and Maya, which is one of the most popular programs and has been for a long time for animation studios, for your Pixar. Right. Yeah, so you're, 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 you, know, you have the foundation already to be making cartoons long Correct. before you even had an idea of any animation. Yeah, and also modeling characters, modeling, modeling anything really. So it, it got to the point where People, when they had those skills, if they enjoyed that kind of work, that led them to seek out non-architectural opportunities once they left school. So I think it just, it, people just learned through studying architecture that there were other opportunities to them that interested them and that they had the technical skills to achieve and they just moved into those industries. One of the things that happened when I graduated college was I had taken enough basic classes in the design department to kind of have a sense of how to program and code and develop. But when I graduated college with my master's, I was a little bit adrift. I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. I had a really, really strong architectural degree. I had an extremely strong interest in multimedia and web design and web development, which was really, that, this was 2000. So it was absolutely starting to take off. We were starting to see that industry really turn into a real thing. Right. This was, this was the, a lot of people forget that this was a brand new world at yeah. the time. This yeah. did not exist. No, it didn't exist. It did absolutely not exist. The people who were the, the, the thought leaders in multimedia development at the time when I was learning were people who just stumbled into it. There, there was no school of multimedia development. There was no school of web development. You could not go to a, to a educational institution and get educated in that. Everybody who had been doing work on the internet up through probably 1998, those were all computer science guys who learned on COBOL and other you know, other programming languages that were designed for accounting software or, you know, controlling how much ketchup is squeezed into a bottle. At right. A, there was not a lot of art and creativity no, behind any of this at that point. None. It was all new. And it, it's probably, 
it's hard to really relay. I feel very lucky that I got to live through a time like that, where there was this massive transition in terms of the way the world worked. Like I mentioned, the, I, the first time I got on the internet, I was a freshman in college. I, there was no internet when I right. was you know, right. in high school. It did yeah. not exist. Yeah. You, it, was, it was ARPANET still. It was yeah. in the libraries. It's how you looked up books that were at a different library. It was still that. So, um, the, so anyway, after I got out of college, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I, I started doing freelance work. I had freelance work in an architectural firm where I did some 3D modeling work for them. I also did some floor plan work, basic stuff like that. Things that I had done when I would worked as an architect. And I also got work doing freelance multimedia design. And the interesting thing was, I fell into the opportunity to teach, to become your teacher at the school that we, that we were at, sort of by accident. And but one of the things that it did was it reignited in me the desire to continue to learn, which ending grad school sort of stopped. You know, after seven years of college, when they finally put that degree in your hand, you're like, oh, <laughs> God bless it. Thank, thank God this is over with. You I'm done. Gone. I'm yeah. done. But, 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 but now what? And um, this opportunity came up to teach. And I always thought maybe I'd be a good teacher. And so I jumped into it. And while at the school, I also took classes in other departments while I was teaching the kids in my own department. I took a class on database development. I took a class on HTML web design. Um, I sat in on classes for other people who were doing design work. I tried to really continue my learning so that I could get to the point where I could be a creative professional in advertising and marketing or in graphic design instead of being an architect. And that paid off after about a year and three months of working uh, as a teacher and doing a lot of freelance work, I finally got offered a full-time job at an ad agency that was doing mostly interactive work, mostly websites. They had a couple big uh, clients, Countrywide Home Loans, before they became the evil loan company. <laughs> right. <laughs> really fell out of existence was one of our main clients. Uh, we had other clients as well. Uh, we oh, it's a, always fun to look back over clients we've had over the years and go, yeah, they don't exist. Yeah, that industry yeah. doesn't exist. Oh, I don't tell anybody about that client. They also had ConAgra Foods which was Slim Jim's, um, Butterball Turkey. You know, I, I got to do a lot of work for that. So that was my first real job in marketing and advertising where I was working for real clients, legit big clients. Um, and that was it. That was the last time I ever worked in architecture or did any architectural work. I, I, I completely went into advertising and marketing after that. I started initially doing a lot of being a development guy, but one of, the, one of my mentors, a guy who was my, my boss at one of my jobs, he basically told me like, look, I think you got the chops to be a creative director. And I don't know if this development thing is going to let you go as high. I don't know if the arc is going to end up as high a point. So you might want to seriously consider transitioning into design. And I did. And so I worked as a multimedia designer for a while, but then I became sort of what you call a pure creative director where I would run teams of creatives. And, and I, I want to get into that because that's something that is fascinating to me they kind of look like the person when you have that conversation like they're kind of like pulling the strings they seem really like they know everything but you don't really know what the creative director does other than he's your boss and you follow what he's right, gonna right. tell you you know it's like I, i'm just I'm, I'm the creative so i get to do something cool yeah. but what does a creative director do i suppose it depends on what kind of creative director you are in my particular case, I saw being a creative director, and I, and I bet you actually you'd find answers toward this were vary. So I'll give you my answer yeah. of how I approached it, but then I'll also tell you what I saw, because I okay. think for people listening, it might be interesting to th for them to hear other paradigms that people follow. Absolutely. I, I took being a creative director as essentially getting the best work I could possibly get out of my people while staying out of their way if they're doing good work. 1% of creative directors? <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I, I took my job as not being the sort of dominant visual force for all the work that was in my group. What I instead tried to do was I tried to set strategies, paradigms, you know, I, I, tried to, I tried to show people what I expected by inculcating them as opposed to telling them what to do. I would try to show them things that I thought were good, explain why I think they're good, why I think they're bad. I was very much a business oriented creative director, which meant it wasn't just about like, well, should this be green or should this be blue? It was about, well, which color is statistically more likely to result in somebody transacting, buying something, selling something, whatever. So I, I took a little bit of a hands-off kind of perspective in terms of the way that I would creative directed. 
And, you know, I had a team, honestly, once your team gets to be about as big as 30 people, which, you know, I, my team was when I was at my last job, you can't be involved in every project. You just can't. Someone no, for come, sure. That's impossible. Yeah. Some, some prod, product manager is going to come up and say, hey, we're launching, we've got this new fitness product. I need an email. I need an email design. You know, I just need a blast. I want an email blast. The creative director of 30 people is not going to look at that. There's no, it's not worth the time. It's not worth the effort. And, you know, you have to spend your time really more on larger top level stuff. Mm -hmm. What, what is this new product's brand going to look like generally? Not what's this email going to look like? So <clears throat> mostly I was a creative director who just tried to keep the wheels on the bus and get the best I could out of the people that I had by encouraging them, supporting them and helping them understand creative is a, is a business, is being a business. It's not being about crayons and colors, but about real business choices. The, so that the reason you call that the 1% <laughs> is because I have seen many a creative director who think that their role is to lord over or approve and control every single aspect of either an organization or projects, whatever. When you work at say an agency, um, and you have a non-client side job, it's true that you do have project oriented stuff and you as the creative director do approve and oversee everything, especially in pitches. Um, when it comes to the actual day-to-day -day work, you're not doing it quite as much in ad, ad agency, but you're more involved. You're also a salesperson. You know, you're out there with the clients trying to sell a product that your company is going to make by presenting examples of product that you've either done for them or product that you've done in the past. So it's a little bit of a talker friendly sales job. When you go client side, it's totally different. You're not pitching all the time because you're not trying to win clients. You really have a client, you have your internal clients and you just do the work for them. And it's more about excellence of work, getting work done, creating a good work environment. And at that level, you've got, um, you know, at, at your level, you, you the creatives you have are gonna be best in class anyway. So letting them do their job yeah. is pretty important yeah. as well. Yeah. I didn't have a 30 person team of junior designers who just got out of college. You know, I had a hierarchy of players. I had veterans at the top who were highly skilled, who are my associate creative directors. And then below them, senior art directors, and then below them, art directors, and then below them, designers <laughs> with each, with each pyramid getting wider, getting a, a broader base. So it, but anyway, to finish up the point that I was talking about, I have seen creatives who take their job as no matter what environment they're in, they have to personally just make every decision. And, and they essentially turn their departments, their people who work for them into their hands. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's working is just the hands of the person at the top who doesn't have a hundred hands. So they can't right. do all the work. Okay. And I found this to be a very, I mean, corrosive really view a point of leadership in the creative industry because it, it disempowers everybody who works for you. It takes away responsibility for them to make something excellent that they view as excellent because they have standards. My goal was to go around and elevate the standards of the people I wasn't watching so that when I wasn't watching, they were going to do the best work they could possibly do. They were going to take personal responsibility for the work that they did. And they were going to potentially have to sell their own work, which means they're going to have to know why they made decisions. They're going to have to be able to explain it to people. And, 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 and you know, a, a creative is an interesting profession because it's a little bit like singing in the shower. Everybody okay. thinks they can sing, you know, everybody thinks they can sing because they have a voice in the same way that everybody thinks that they're a chef because they have a mouth and everybody thinks they're a graphic designer because they have eyes. The, the truth is it's a profession where the professional ethos and the, the things you learn as a professional are not immediately obvious to a person looking in from the outside. And as a result of that, especially client side, one of the things you have to provide is space for your designers to be the experts, to be the people who actually know what the best solution is when the people they're working for are not clients, but in fact, coworkers. Um, when you work in an agency, you don't really have that problem. People hire you and they pay agencies a lot of money because they expect that the people in there are the tastemakers, the skilled people, the people who know what's going on. So it's a little bit of a different paradigm, client side versus, versus um, agency side. But in either case, what people view as their role in terms of creative direction isn't entirely based on it being a standard thing in the industry. It's also about the person's personality, who they are, how they view 
working with other people. Uh, I'm kind of egalitarian inherently in terms of the way I view work groups. So that was the way I led, but that that's also what I believe a really good creative director is. Mm, okay. Okay. Well, that, 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 that's good. Cause that, you know, that, I mean, that gives a lot of crea- young creators hope that they're going to be working on working with people that are uh, <laughs> leading them down the right path. Um, so there yeah. is no segue back to this other than, uh, then you threw it all away and said, I don't want to do it anymore. And I want to make it all, <laughs> <threw> it all <laughs> away. Threw it all away. Uh, you know, I had, I had an executive level job at a place, like I said, I had like a 30 person staff and, you know, I was, I had the, 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 the nice car and the, I had the nice apartment and the big job and the big salary. And, you know, it just, it got to the point where I had seen other really high senior level people leave the company I work at and go out and quote unquote, do their own thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm a little bit conservative when it comes to how I approach my life and my finances and all that kind of stuff. I'm the kind of guy who gets a job and keeps a job, tries to keep a job. Okay. Um, I had been at that company for over five years. And which is a long time for a lot of people in, in the creative yes, industry too. Yes. I'd never been in another job for longer than two, but client side is different because when you go client side, you, you tend to be there for a longer period of time because, because you're transitioning into a different kind of lifestyle because you don't mm-hmm. want to work weekends and nights every week, you know, you want, it gives you the possibility of having a regular life. You lose the prestige of being at Shia Day or DDB or publicist, mm-hmm. one of the publicist properties or something like that. You lose that prestige, but you gain a lot of quality of life things. Yeah. So I, I just got to a point, and I think this is the bane potentially of all creatives where I wasn't feeling challenged, you know, I just wasn't feeling like there was enough new stuff to keep me from becoming bored is really the only way I can put it. And that was tricky because you get to a point where you're comfortable, financially comfortable, you're comfortable with your career, with your, what you're doing. And suddenly you're like, Oh, now I've, now I've got to the top of the the hill. It's like, (laughs) Oh, look at that hill over there. Look at that much taller hill that I can go climb. Having the job let me get a lot of the foundational work done for Thrill and also for the other company we haven't talked about yet, which is Micro Wilderness. And um, it, it gave me an opportunity to have regular income while I was getting things set up in order to launch these businesses. I didn't just one day quit my job and start from zero on the next thing. I, I essentially, when I quit my job, I had already had a year's worth of time to kind of put this, this machinations into, into, into. Right. Uh, so you freed up your nights and weekends in your job to fill your nights and weekends with a potential, a potential other venture that's now, you know, taking over your life completely in, correct, in the correct. most positive way. And I, and this this, this kind of happened around uh, Christmas season last year was when I really got serious about, especially about thrill. And so, you know, I had, this was before the pandemic. Um, for those of you listening to this, from the <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, so did you get to go outside today? No. If somebody listened to this in 2021, they'd be like pandemic. So, you know, <laughs> this past Christmas was great. I sold a lot of product and I, you know, I, I, I had pretty good months. And then even once the pandemic, even this year, once the pandemic was going, um, I still had a lot of really good months. So, you know, it, it's it, the financial situation for the country hadn't really negatively impacted the business. And so, as a result of that, I kind of made a decision that oh, I'm going to keep leaning into this until it doesn't work really well. Now, because of the pandemic, everybody's slowing down everywhere, and even I'm feeling it. Sure. July, July wasn't a great one, month for me. August hasn't really been a great month for me. You know, my hope is, like most retailers, to try, you know, you make a lot of your money in September, three months, three October, months out of the year. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're almost, I worked for a guy when I was in high school who had a cart in the mall, you know, you used to cart to see in the malls. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was around when that was invented. I remember the first time I went to the mall and was like, what, what is this stuff? These guys are in the middle of the mall. So I ended up working most of my high school years at one of these places. And one of the guys I worked for, he's Brazilian. Dude, 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 you have to be fancy when you explain it. It's called a kiosk. A kiosk, sorry. A yeah. kiosk. I feel we okay. call it I, I worked at a kiosk as well. A cart's okay. just so kind of yeah. low rent. Car, it's a kiosk. I know it's, I know it's Florida. So, so taking, taking your formative education and architecture and, and dovetailing that with your, uh, super wild, happy, fun time kiosk adventure yeah. turned you into a private business owner that you it, are today. Kind of, yes. <laughs> to, close, to close the circle on that, that guy told me, 
that guy told me I never make money until these last three months. Right. I break even throughout the year. So knowing that, knowing that, that's how I sort of planned starting the business while I was working. I planned to really launch it for real in September. And that gave me the success through Christmas to make me want to quit my job. And I, I do a little bit of freelance work. I don't want to make it sound like I completely abandoned, you know, doing graphic design or graphic art or anything, because I still do that kind of work. Sure. But it's on a much, much smaller scale now, because most of my time is spent, you know, working on the retail side of the business. Way back early, we were talking was, you know, you said retail businesses. You've got two businesses now. You've got Thrill Studio, and then you have- Micro um, Wilderness. Micro Wilderness, which we're going to get into. I didn't pick but, that theme, but it's a, yes, Micro uh, but that's a But you spent a lot of time- deep in the trenches with major world brands and international brands and national brands. And you've been able to take all that and go, well, I know how to do this. I can apply yes. it to now spiders. Uh, so explain to me, <laughs> explain to me how spiders came about. Well, okay. Well, so to a certain extent that is true. But I want to caveat something because I think some of the people who might be listening to this might be students or potential students. The reality was it advertising for ConocoPhillips, their gasoline additive, is not really the same as me personally selling toys to individual people. Sure. Oh, it, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But it's 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 playing at that really high level that gives you the confidence to believe in yourself. Because what you discover when you work especially at the place kind of places I worked at where we had fortune 500 companies as clients, you know, I was working with CMOs of fortune 500 companies. You realize they're just regular people. They're, they're not geniuses. They're just regular people who just were the person who got promoted into that position. You, once you get a chance to see the CEOs and the CMOs and the CFOs of a lot of these major companies, you realize like they're just regular people. They're not geniuses of any kind. People tend to think that every CEO is Steve Jobs or every CEO is Elon Musk. And it's absolutely not like, it's 100% not like that. They're just people who got up the corporate ladder for whatever reason or another. And in a lot of cases, the reason they got up the corporate ladder was not because they were amazing at what they did or they're luminaries the way Musk is or the way Gates is. It's just because they had the personal relationships. They just worked their way to the top because they were seen as the person who could run the company. So working in that world, let me understand that any person who's sufficiently motivated and has a good head on their shoulders and is curious and is hardworking can probably go out and do the same kind of thing that those people did. And I'd say that that's generally true. I, I got lucky because architecture was a creative profession, but it also had a very rigorous structured component, a mentally rigorous structured component, because you have to make a building. It has to work. It has to be, right. it, has to be you know? <laughs> it has to stay up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it combines the left and right brain which is why I was able to move into design and programming because those are also left and right brain activities, yeah. which was what a lot of early, a lot of the early multimedia development was that you had to code to make good animations, visually good animations. Well, so how, okay. So how can we set up spiders? Cause I, to me, that's still, that's still. Well, let me just spin right into it from yeah. a story about Nate. Yeah. So, I tried to do the, the, the miniatures and I was doing a lot of the painting, the painted miniature stuff. And it turned out that after about six to eight months of doing it, once I finally had financial data that I could analyze, I realized it wasn't that profitable. That by the time you throw in my advertising costs, my administrative costs, the material costs, all that stuff, the margins were very, very low. So the same guy who was doing the painting, who was really one of my primary painters, he is really interested in unusual pets. He has geckos. He has like a nearly extinct salamander. He's oh, got geez. like, you know, he's got like snakes. He's got he, he, scorpions. He, he breeds all kinds of things. But this was kind of a side hobby for him, whereas the painting was his main thing for making money. So what happened was when we started having conversations about it, look, man, this, this painting is, I can't keep doing this. It's not profitable. This isn't going to work out properly and financially. Um, he sort of leaned over to what he was doing with his animals. And he had one or two very rare spiders. And he ended up playing the game. I don't know what this game is called, but I hear about it from time to time, where you take one thing that's worth a certain amount and you trade it for two things that are worth more than that. Okay. And then you take those two things and you trade them for eight <laughs> things that are worth more than that. And you take, so he had this weird period where 
while he was still doing the painting work, he was trading up some of the rare animals that he had that he knew how to care for for more common animals, which could be sold to your average person who likes those spider kind of collector. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing about these kinds of pets is it's a little bit different for arachnids, reptiles. It's more like baseball cards. To our, to our discussion that we were having earlier. Yeah. Like pe people buy spiders to have this various spider breeds, not because it's an animal that they can pet and, and love right. and show right. affection for them. <laughs> you know, like people will say like, oh yeah, my spider is friendly with me and he'll get on me and stuff like that. But there's no emotional exchange like there is with dogs, cats, sure. Sure. you know, even, even rare other rare mammal species that people have as pets, you know, horses, you know, farm animals. I mean, there, there, there's, there's even an emotive component to pigs to a certain extant and sure. goats. You know, these animals are really not like that. It's called microwilderness.com. I want to make Correct. sure I get that in there correctly. Correct. Um, was, you know, these spiders, and we were going to talk just spiders on, yes. on, in this end, are in very small boxes. So you could literally collect them all. You have a wall <laughs> of all yeah. these small, small footprint, uh -huh. highly exotic, yeah. wacky looking, Somebody walks in and goes, oh my God, spiders. And Correct. that's kind of fun to have happen yeah, when people neat. walk into your house. Yeah. Um, so as a collectible, I, I get it from that aspect. Hmm. So that makes sense. Um, but how did the business okay, so, come about? So he has all these animals. He traded up for larger numbers of them. And it got to the point where he said like, look, I've got, I've got too many now. I want to sell some. Well, can we make a website the way we made the Thrill website? and sell the animals. So basically, you know, Thrill, because it needed to go more into an unpainted area and that really had nothing to do with him, went one direction. Mm -hmm. And Micro, which had everything to do with him, but needed an investor, needed somebody to put money into it and, and to do the administrative things that he didn't want to do. Inventory management, website development, uh, accounting, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about it and basically I decided to invest in that. So I started investing money in you know, getting spiders. We got, initially we got them from um, various people around the United States and then we got an import export license. And now we have had spiders come in from Germany and Mexico so far. So we bring them in. I, <laughs> I, I just, I, 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 you know, sorry, my brain froze. It's just like, you're yeah. sitting there going, so, yep, I, I just import some spiders just very calmly, bring some <laughs> spiders in, they come into my house, I got a box of spiders yep. and, you know, we got to sort them out yeah. and, you know, put these spiders in, you know, the funny thing is, I don't know what's creepier. Is these spiders are not small little spiders that are going to oh. crawl inside your ear and kill you. They're these massive hand size spiders yeah, that yeah. will crawl on top of you and kill you. Well, okay. So first, firstly, firstly, yes, microwilderness.com. And by the way, the thrill studio.com is the toys, the thrill studio, the thrill studio. Got it. Okay. Firstly, they're, they're a little bit misunderstood. They're not like, they're not, they don't, there are no known dead, deadly spiders. Yeah, 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 they're yeah. truly can kill you. Uh, there are ones that will bite you and you'll be in so much pain that you'll want to die. <laughs> but um, everybody has to remember that spiders are sick, crazy animals. They want to eat their food live. Spiders eat food live. Right. So their venom is designed to maim, incapacitate, damage, hobble, paralyze, whatever. <laughs> it has all of those various effects. So I don't know. I don't have any of them here at my house because, <laughs> I, and I have never held, I've never held the tarantula size, the full tarantula size. So when we say tarantula, we usually mean something that will yeah, you know, that's a, as big as a it hand. covers your entire hand. Yeah, the yeah, body, yeah. the thorax, and the cephalophorax is about as big as like the center of my palm, and then the legs reach out to the edges. Yeah, um, we, but we a, also, a, 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 little, a little nightmare in the palm of your hand. Oh yeah, it, oh dude, yeah. <laughs> we got we had a shipment from Mexico that had uh, some Brachypelma smithies, which are very docile. We actually try to get um, uh, spiders from Mexico because the, those breeds are extremely docile. Okay. But they sent us ones that were like eight inches big. I mean, these things came out of oh, the bin and they were, oh, they were already geez. as big as a hand, basically, you know, like yeah. kind of a Yeah, thing. covering your face. No, no, thank you. No, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm good. <laughs> so um, I'm with you. I'm a little nervous around them and I don't mess with them too much. Um, I've held the geckos and the snakes because I've, sure. I've, I've held snakes before when I was a kid because I had a friend who had snakes. Yeah. And the geckos are not really that, if they bite onto you, they'll twist and they'll tear, they'll tear a piece off of you, but they can't really harm you. Yeah. Um, and and, and this, most of our spiders, the ones that are really dangerous, the ones that, whose bite would in fact be very uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable, 
Um, we keep them in a special cage inside of another cage. They're, they're isolated yeah. from everything else. Um, so the group got started when Nate basically said, look, I want to do this. I'm interested in this. Will you invest? And I essentially I did. So we started looking around to get ex imports. We got an import export license from the government and we started looking around for people to buy from and we started importing the animals, did the website development and design and then launched it. So now it, it, this is a hard thing to figure out is now that you've got two small businesses, which are, are thriving, uh, are looking to thrive. Yeah. Um, what's the next step for you as you've, I, I don't want to say you've turned your back on a creative career because you certainly have not turned your back on a creative career. No. You're no longer an executive in a creative career. Yes. What you're I, doing with the thrill studio is highly creative. Yes. And what you're doing with micro wilderness is equally creative and you're using all of those skill set in a lifetime, uh, a very short lifetime. Cause I'm not, I'm not going to call you old at all because we're about the same age, but, a, but a, uh, I'm 42. You're only really no, four years old. younger than me when I was your teacher. Well, you got yeah, that's that's why that's why I was not that impressed. <laughs> I hope you're editing this part out. That'll that get edited. Out. You had a great career as a creative, yeah. um, and now you're 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 in this turn of investing in and creating new ventures. Yeah. How did your career as a creative put you into the mindset to do that? I think. One of the things about the creative professions in general is in, built into them inherently is problem solving. If you, if you want to become, say, a biologist, really what you're doing as a biologist is you're discovering things that already exist, right? Mm -hmm. As a creative, you're inventing things that don't exist. In fact, the people who are the best creatives are the ones who are the most inventive, the most you know, luminary when it comes to being able to come up with new ideas, new ways of selling products, new ways of talking about things. And I've always felt that coming from creative career backgrounds, it teaches you to be hungry to solve problems. It teaches you the joy of figuring things out. Um, it's actually something that Richard Feynman said. He was a really famous physicist. You know, I think one of his books is called The Joy of Finding Things Out. Okay. And creative professions tend to foster that kind of thought process in an individual because it's all about you. When you're given a project in school and you're expected to figure out a, a solution for it, there's nobody else. There's just you and you have to invent something from scratch. So I've always felt that even though what I'm doing now isn't really where I started, I'm certainly not a multimedia developer because that's not even a thing. Flash websites aren't even a thing anymore. Right, right. You know, the industry that I literally changed into from architecture, it's it just gone. It doesn't exist. What kept me going was a desire to improve myself professionally, a desire to learn new things, a desire to solve new problems, which is really what creative education is entirely about. So I, I think that was enormously beneficial to me. It doesn't matter that I'm not working in architecture. What matters is that I learned to learn. I learned to take responsibility for my own work. I learned to, I learned how to go through a process of solving a problem in a way that was satisfying to me both intellectually but also rationally in terms of it actually being a solution that worked and i think creative professionals are uniquely positioned in society in that sense in the way that a lot of other people just aren't so i hope you are ready to purchase some spiders because those are the world's best christmas gifts i believe but also check out microwilderness.com for all the spiders the Thrill Studio for all of the cool figurines. And of course, check out academyart.edu slash creative mind. Because as more and more art and design career opportunities are on the rise, employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. At Academy of Art University, you will get the work ready skills that employers want today. You can study on site in downtown San Francisco and, of course, anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request more info about our 40 plus areas of study in art and design, including game development, UX design, industrial design, graphic design, visit our website at academyart.edu slash creative mind. My name is Bobby Brill. Thank you for listening and please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to so you never miss an episode of Creative Mind.